Okay, so let's talk about the types of fires. We have, we have uh, in terms of wildfires, three main types of fires. We have ground fires. And so this is just what it sounds like. This is fire that's going to expand um, over vegetation that is not very tall and is proximate to the soil surface. Uh, not usually not dramatic flames, more small flames and more smoldering. Um, this would be uh, typical in something like an area that perhaps has been mowed. And so there, there is fuel. There still is maybe, you know, the, the blades of grass, but they've been mowed. So they're, they're lying down on the soil surface, um, for example. Um, we also get ground fires in places like those peatlands that we, that we mentioned earlier. And this is, this is probably at least in the, in the say place like the Central Valley in our in our historic California grasslands. This is probably more typically how the fire migrated through them. Most of our when we think of California grasslands now, most of what you're seeing, most of what you're envisioning is non-native uh, introduced Eurasian grass species and forb species and thistles and things uh, from from Europe and Asia. And that has created a much larger amount of biomass that, that produces much longer flame lengths and things of that nature than uh, what we believe are historic uh, grasslands, uh, uh, the, veg the vegetative community that we believe was existing in our historic California grasslands before Europeans came to California. And then, you know, so here's an example of a of a, of a spreading uh, ground fire. It's not very high. You can you know, typically step over the flames if there are flames to speak of, et cetera. Uh, okay, then we have surface fires. So surface fires would be um, maybe the more typical, uh, not maybe, but, but more typical than ground fires. Um, they move along the surface, uh, definitely have some flaming definitely have more flaming than that last example that we talked about, longer flame lengths. And, and when I say flame lengths, I don't think I to find that. Flame lengths would be the, 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 from the fuel or the ground, depending on what we're talking about here, but the fuel to the top of the uh, farthest flame is what, we're, is what we mean by flame length. And that would be measured in whatever the, the straightest line is. So if the if it was blowing super hard and the flames were at 45 degree angles, you'd measure them at 45 degree angles. If there was no wind at all and the flames are going straight up, you'd measure flame length uh, uh, 90 degrees to the, the fuel or the ground. Um, yeah, generally speaking, surface fires, relatively slow burning um, and march across the landscape. Uh, then a uh, crown fires. Uh, I, I should say with all these different things we're talking about, Effect of fuels, uh, influence of landscapes and topography, weather, and then types of fires. Oftentimes, the general public does not get this. Oftentimes, well, smart politicians get this, informed politicians get this, but but um, I'll just say uh, it's fairly common when we are having a disaster um, for folks. Uh, to not fully understand stuff and to confuse different types of fires or think that all fires are forest fires or, or something of that nature. Crown fires are um, uh, some of our most devastating fires. These are, um, as, as the name implies, it's not just the ground burning. It's not just the low vegetation burning. It's the um, you know, potentially entirety of the, the tree, the entirety of the forest um, cross section is on fire. And um, by crown fires, we mean that those flames have gotten to the top of the trees. And this is oftentimes wind fueled and uh, very common in places like the Sierras, very mountainous type terrain um, that, uh, that can really get these, these things going and these can be devastating. Regions that are at, at risk from wildfires, uh, classically grasslands, classically woodlands. Um, what's a, what's a forest? What's a woodland? Um, well, uh, a good question. <laughs> uh, there isn't a, a perfect definition, but from a landscape perspective, what we would describe a woodland, that would be something like an oak wood. Here in California, we describe something like an oak woodland. Um, and a woodland would be woody, veg you know, tall woody vegetation, 
a community that is um, only about set, looking from the air, only about 70% um, of vegetation and 30% um, non woody. So grasses, bare rock, things of that nature. Whereas a forest, a forest is going to be much more closed canopy on average and um, be much more of a uniform uh, vegetative structure. So if we imagine we're, we're floating over the, the community with a, in a hot air balloon with some marbles or something, and we threw those marbles down in a woodland, we'd be more likely for those marbles to strike the ground or get to the ground, whereas in a forest, or directly. Whereas in a forest, we throw it and they're much more likely to be bouncing off branches, etc. Uh, also, woodlands tend to be not be as tall as forests. Forests tend to be have trees that that grow straighter and higher. Um, okay, so grasslands, uh, woodlands here in California, it's oak woodlands, shrublands. Shrublands would be things like the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, the foothills around Ventura, etc. Um, and increasingly, surprisingly, tundra, um, particularly with climate change, that's exposing some of these. Uh, the, the permafrost and some of these uh, other communities that historically we thought are not particularly um, prone to wildfires. We've seen the last uh, couple years massive fires in the northern parts of Russia, massive fires in Alaska, massive fires in Canada, uh, in the, in the um, polar regions or near the polar regions of those areas. Um, and it's true that, that pretty much anywhere could, in theory, burn. And as we've seen with examples from uh, Indonesia, examples from uh, Brazil, with the current regime that's, that's running Brazil, uh, they actively encouraged uh, fires uh, and uh, said there's no problem with fires until it was so obvious that no one could breathe that then they sort of sent in some folks to, in theory, do something with the um, anthropogenically started uh, burning of the Amazonian rainforest. But we can even have wildfires in deserts, uh, in wetlands. Uh, historically, not many fires in deserts, but the introduction, introduction of things like cheat grass, again, another Eurasian non-native grass that's come into a lot of the Southwest, has created these opportunities for fuel and the ability for a, a whatever spark and ignition does happen to actually uh, reach more and more fuel and have a sustained fire. Same with wetlands. Wetlands, if we take our examples here in Southern California, one, it's because we tend to have drought conditions, but also we've introduced other non-native species. The classic one would be Arundo donax, the giant bamboo-like um, invader that's in our riparian corridors. Um, has started in the riparian corridors, invaded down the watershed, down into our coastal salt marshes and coastal wetlands. And um, uh, that plant can burn much more uh, readily. That, that's much better fuel than the traditional wetland plant uh, vegetation. And so uh, they are bringing fire actually into places like Magoo Lagoon and, and locations like that. Um, we see, in our part of the world, we see wildfires most common here, right? No surprise to us. Um, Alaska, the western uh, states, um, <clears throat> southwest, uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, the Canadian Rockies, we see some large fires, and this, this um, belt of <clears throat> uh, large forested territory um, along the sort of... Um, uh, northern U.S., southern Canadian border, uh, uh, propensity for fire there. Um, the risk sort of shifts from year to year, but um, we are seeing now pretty much perpetually Alaska, pretty much perpetually uh, southwestern U.S. It, it's, it, it shifts a bit, but it's always bad. Every year seems to be bad now, particularly compared to historic conditions. Um, and so this is just some examples from about 20 years of fires, about from about 20 years ago. But, but even then you can see, uh, yes, we do have fires in Georgia. Yes, we do have fires in Virginia, et cetera. But obviously the big story is in the Western U.S. and, <clears throat> and Alaska, excuse me. Um, okay, uh, what, what, so we have a fire. What does that wildfire do to our environment? A uh, question so far yet about anything, you guys? Okay.
Okay. Okay. Okay. So, um, so then we have this fire boom. It comes through. What does it do? <clears throat> Fires have lots of, uh, a direct and indirect effects on our ecosystem. The first I want to highlight are the edaphic effects. And, and edaphic is a term that um, uh, doesn't seem to be used a whole lot in, in your guys' intro to bio courses and stuff these days. So um, it, this is, edaphic is of or relating to the soil. So, um, so fire can change the soil. First and foremost, the most conspicuous thing that we see uh, are the changes to um, the hydrophobicity. So we, we start out, let's imagine our uh, your hillside outside of your house or, or the, the park near your house or whatever. And think about it. And you, you uh, maybe you're watering your lawn or the, the park uh, in your neighborhood is watering the lawn or the school is watering the, the baseball diamond or whatever, right? So we're used to putting water on this system and the soil surface is there. There's some plants. There's a soil surface. Um, water gets into that soil, right? So it gets into that soil in a couple different ways. One, the, the stems, the, the, the structures of vegetation that are penetrating the soil are making little micro channels so that water can get in. But then also just the soil itself, water can percolate through in most cases, not every single case, but in most cases in the, in the quote unquote typical situation. Once we burn that, once we apply high temperature to that soil, we uh, change the, the nature of, of that soil. And oftentimes we create hydrophobic or uh, water fearing or water repelling um, soil, or at least a layer of that soil on the surface. So now when it rains, first and foremost, we've, we've burned off the grass or the, the shrub. And so it's, there aren't those, or at least there aren't as many channels for water to sort of follow the tissue into the ground. And then the soil that's left behind is almost like a little bit of a um, scotch guard, right? A little bit of water, repel, a little bit of like a chemical repellent almost over the surface of the water. So now when the raindrops hit that, Instead of uh, hitting it and going in, they hit and they roll off and they roll downward with gravity. So this is going to increase dramatically runoff. And then in turn, because now that water is moving down the slope with much greater force, it's going to have more erosivity. So it's going to come in and it's going to tend to pull more soil down, like a, like a snowball going down the mountain, picking up more snow. Um, and then for the folks that live downstream, or the communities downstream, we're going to get, when the water does come, it's going to tend to come much more intensely, much faster. So we have more runoff, more erosion, more flooding downstream or, or downslope. Um, as I mentioned, so, uh, that erosion is going on. <clears throat> Again, because we've lost the vegetation, that's going to act as a physical anchor to that soil. And um, yeah, yeah, and so I already mentioned this stuff. <clears throat> so here we go. So this is the, the classic story. So on the left would be the unburned condition. <clears throat> oh, I left off. Also, there's litter or duff on the surface typically or, or, or some amount of organic material on the surface. That's going to act to keep the soil a little bit more humid and, um, and the microbes and everything a little bit more happy, etc. Fire comes in, uh, nukes all that. And, uh, and so the remaining community on, on the right is uh, much more problematic. And particularly if this community on the right is not perfectly flat, right? So if it's at any kind of slope at all, that's where we tend to get the problems uh, going on. Okay. So that, that's the, that's the effect on the soil. We also have effect in the atmosphere. Um, wildfires can create their own clouds. Uh, there's just a paper that I, I will put in the reading. Um, that just came out, uh, I don't remember, a week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, on all the stuff that's mobilized in a uh, in, in these increasingly large-scale wind-driven wildfires, uh, all kinds of crazy fungal spores and, and all kinds of nasty stuff. <clears throat> so wildfires are creating their own clouds, and in those clouds, potentially a, a much 
greater concentration of things that are potentially problematic for those of us that breathe air. So there's more soot, there's more particulate matter, which we usually talk about um, PM. So there's PM10 and PM2.5, which refers to the sort of medium size and the finer scale size of particles. The finer the scale, the easier it is to penetrate through our nose hair and mucus and throats and all that kind of stuff and get into the little nooks and crannies down deep in our lungs that tends to cause more chronic breathing problems and longer term health effects. Um, and then uh, also uh, as these um, wildfires hit the wildlands urban interface are, are part of our human society. Um, uh, we're, we're going to be burning up things like whatever the heck's in your garage, right? Your, your paint cans and your, your weed killer and all that other uh, type of stuff that will oftentimes go into the atmosphere. Um, uh, wildfires themselves can also be contributors to ground level ozone and other, um, local scale air pollution warnings and, and, and problems and contribute, can, can contribute to uh, local smog as well. Uh, with climate change, this is probably pretty obvious for, for us, but just to, just to make sure we mention it or touch on it briefly at least, um, climate change is increasing the intensity and the frequency at which wildfires are occurring. So the scale and the return rate of these events. Now, there's, there's a complex thing going on here, as we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but uh, we also have been changing the, the historic fuel amounts. We humans, have, by making management choices, have actually worsened the problem. So there's, there's both we made it more likely to burn just by our, our non-climate change activities, and then climate change, another level, is also making it more likely to burn, and when it does burn, to burn more intensively. Um, how does that work? Well, just all those things we mentioned before, changing uh, temperature, making it hotter. So, so right, the global weirding that's happening is we're getting, in our part of the world, we're getting drier. And when it does rain, it's getting, it's, it's more intense, it's more liquid in a shorter amount of time. So more intense precipitation over smaller spatial scales and temporal scales. So we get these just massive dumps. And if you're in the middle of a fire, wow, great, boom, the massive dump put out the fire. But, but um, we don't get this longer term water that's going to slowly be coming down over the course of months and recharging those groundwater res reservoirs. Instead, it's much more likely to dump and then run off and go straight into the ocean or, or straight into a lake or something of that nature. Um, th though that increasing temperature also is um, uh, decreasing humidity at the local scale. Um, we are seeing more replacement of woody communities with more um, uh, grasslands and forblands. And those uh, fuels tend to be what we call flashier fuels. So, so easier to ignite, easier to, so, so, so if we had a, a pile of grass and we had a pile of wood, um, we can catch both on fire, but on average, if we we're throwing a match, the grass is going to be more likely to initially ignite, to combust initially, um, as compared to just regular old wood. Um, and so, so those, so the more the more grassy, the more weedy our landscape. Um, and again, weeds are encouraged under um, our changed uh, climate conditions. Um, that's problematic as well more lightning strikes because of these more intense storms. And then um, uh, the last one, particularly in the places like the Western US and in the boreal areas, are the explosion of insects that tend to kill trees. So here we're talking about things like bark beetles. A bark beetle is a critter that's been around forever, right? Living with these trees forever. So it's not a new phenomenon. So the organisms aren't new phenomena, but they typically had one um, life history cycle over the course of a typical year because the and and and, and uh, temperature strongly regulates how fast they grow um, and how f fast they go through metamorphosis and go through the different instar stages in their in their life history so that they would have an adult which could reproduce lay eggs etc before it got cold in the year now we're having areas in the u.s 
and this has been going on for about 20, well, for a while, but at least a good solid 20 years now, where these insects are having two generations or, or completing two cycles through their life history each season. And indeed, in some places, we're getting three cycles. So whereas the forest could have handled, you know, one, one wave of these, of these beetles, for example, now we're getting boom, boom, boom. And so we have massive swaths across the Western U.S., places like Colorado, places like the Eastern Sierra Nevada that are, that, that, you know, large swaths, the majority of the trees or close to the majority of the trees are, are essentially dead. They're, they're standing up, they haven't fallen down, but they're, they're super dry, right? So, so dead vegetation is more likely to burn than living vegetation and we're killing all these uh, trees. Um, okay. Um, so what happens with biological effects? This is one of the things that, that I've done some work on um, in terms of wildfires. Um, obviously with vegetation, fire can just burn up the stuff, destroy it, boom, take it away. Other, um, uh, let's say trees might survive, but they might have half of their branches burned off or they're in some way, shape or form stressed out um, and still alive, but but not doing the function that they historically were, not providing the same amount of, say, nesting uh, habitat for the birds or not setting the same amount of acorns for the scrub jays or the California ground squirrels or things of that nature. Uh, it is true that, um, again, as I mentioned before, uh, fire is, is, a, is an important part of our ecosystem. And so I've been talking about this mostly as a bad thing, but we do have whole communities that would not exist or would not be particularly healthy without wildfire. And a lot of our Mediterranean ecosystem plant communities fall into this category. So uh, many of our uh, plants in and around places like the Santa Monica Mountains um, require fire. So um, they uh, depend on fire because fire will open up the canopy and allow for some critters to um, be early colonists and get in and, and, and start um, uh, establishing in these bare areas. Others are obligate. Uh, so, so, so in other words, some, some need fire to do well. They don't quote unquote require fire. Others actually physiologically require fire. So the classic story here would be some seeds that need fire to germinate. So some uh, plants, have so the seeds have to actually be cooked. They have to be heated. In other cases, some seeds have to be exposed to smoke, not just fire smoke from your, from your backyard uh, fire, but actually smoke from uh, fires that that where the fuel is other uh, Mediterranean ecosystem shrubs and trees burning. So specific oils and specific volatile compounds. And the mechanism there is usually that smoke triggers a physiological change in the outer shell, the outer husk of those seeds and makes it, uh, allows water to now be able to start coming, coming into the seed to penetrate the seed outer coat. Once that water comes in, then the seed starts to physiologically wake up and, and generate and start to set and start to grow, germinate. Um, and we have some of these seeds can persist for at least in, on some species, at least a hundred years. Um, and this is not in some this is not in some climate controlled vault in the Smithsonian. This is just out in this on the slopes of our mountains because they are the seeds are so protected and so physiologically inert waiting for that fire trigger to start growing. Okay, and then uh, what's with animals, we'll talk about animals when we get into some of our case studies, but the short version is that a lot, what we found is around here is large bodied critters, generally speaking, run away and, and survive the fires uh, or, or have a higher likelihood of surviving the fires. Smaller bodied animals do not. Smaller bodied animal, animals hunker down and they usually get toasted literally um, in these fires. Their habitats are altered. So even if an animal survives or a population of animals survive, when they come back out, they're facing a very different landscape. So birds that might have flown away, they come back and there's, there's no, their nests are gone. Uh, their, their seeds or nuts or vegetation 
insects are gone, um, that kind of stuff. So um, problematic. And then with uh, regards to, to us, to people, one of the first dramatic things people appreciate is, is water quality has changed. So our creeks, rivers, streams, lakes, things of that nature can be heavily altered. Indeed, even our, our coastlines. Um, people want to go surf or whatever, but the, the uh, water quality might be horrible in the wake of these fires, oftentimes is. Um, the uh, physical short-term irritants um, from the smoke are, are very real and non-trivial. And then, of course, we just have the outright destruction. Just like the animals have their habitats destroyed, we have our habitats destroyed when our houses burn up or schools burn up or something of that nature. Um, the ecosystem services provided by wildfires include things. Uh, so initially we have the, the, the making of the soil hydrophobic, but once we get past that little bit, um, we have all this other carbon, other materials, burnt nitrogen and, and things of that nature. And this stuff can act as something of a fertilizer for the soils and can really help uh, ex see explosions of some of our uh, microbial community and then in turn uh, other, other critters. Um, again, in terms of the benefits for the macroscopic critters that we're thinking of, like our deer and like our um, shrubs and things, um, initially the fire is going to be a disturbance force, and so it's going to act to uh, change the competition uh, landscape and allow some uh, plants or animals that maybe were just barely scraping by, some of those might be able to thrive in the wake of the fires. Um, and as I mentioned before, seeds, some seeds need wildfire to, to either be um, germinated or in some cases to be spread. Some, some seeds actually pop and explode in the flames and they, they disperse themselves that way. Um, fire can be great for, so if we do have some of these invasive grasses, for example, we can use fire to uh, suppress them and to burn them up and to take care of them and, and, and take them out of the picture. Uh, I already mentioned nutrients um, and yeah, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, one of the in terms of the modern era, one of the uh, great learning points, there's, there's many different fires that we've learned from, but but it seems uh, what really captured the public's attention, there's YouTube videos now on, on, on this and, and nature documentaries and all kinds of fantastic stuff, but there was an incredibly large fire in Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone, our first national park. Um, anybody remember the, the year Yellowstone was founded as a national park? First one in the world? 1746. Ooh, uh, not 17, 18. 72. Yes, you're right. It was 1872. Oh, That's yeah. right. 1872. That's right. Totally. <laughs> totally. 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 So, um, 1872. Um, if you're ever stuck, at least if you're if you're trying to remember, like remember the Buffalo Soldiers, Bob Marley's on Buffalo Soldier, right? So, so the, that those those cores were in the wake of the Civil War, and so um, when we declared Yellowstone as a as a national park. We, we sent in some, some folks to protect it. And so the Buffalo soldiers were the first crew sent out there to, uh, you know, secure, quote unquote, the area. And that's also why the National Park Service, why the, the rangers wear those kind of old, old timey hats and stuff, right? So it's, it's essentially inherited from that post-Civil War era. This is, this is a little bit getting into what we'll talk about uh, in the next version of stuff. But um, uh, people began to understand that, hey, maybe we shouldn't be suppressing fires everywhere, right? And so um, in these areas that are, um, you know, natural, in these areas that are wilderness, um, maybe we shouldn't be doing active firefighting. And so therefore, we started this policy, or we announced this policy in 1976 that says, hey, if we have fires, fires are natural, we're, we're going to let the fires do their fire thing, uh, by and large, unless there's, you know, a family there or some incredibly important, uh, you know, communications tower or something like that. And uh, so the test came about a decade later in 1988, uh, when we had a huge series of storms that started a bunch of fires and um, 
we initially put some people out to try to control the fires didn't really work and it was very clear that we it wasn't going to be able to work and so basically uh, pulled out and waited for the um, fall and winter weather to put out the fires um, uh, it was a huge controversy at the time because it blackened you know this this national treasure and it wasn't let people wasn't letting people recreate in the summer and fall and so the communities around Yellowstone were saying oh my god this is horrible our businesses are tanking all this and that but turns out as um, evidenced by um, our ecosystems here in California that are fire dependent um, given enough space given enough time given enough rain and in these issues um, this the system will recover from the disturbance. Um, more generally, when we talk about places like here in California, and we talk about dealing with this particular hazard um, and, and confronting the disasters that have been uh, manifest in the last couple of years, um, the, the task is really, uh, you know, where do we deploy forces? Um, historically, it was where do we deploy forces in the you know summer, late summer, early fall. We've really moved to almost not quite, but almost a year-round fire season in California um, because of climate change and the, all these issues we've just touched on. Um, and so, oh, there's a huge controversy. Is or not controversy? That's not fair. Um, there are tough decisions that have to be made every year as to how we should go about fighting fires. Fighting fires is a paramilitary endeavor. So uh, fire departments, so-called mutual aid, um, and the whole system that's set up works very well, but it is absolutely um, uh, like a, a, a branch of the military, um, even though my firefighting friends would not say that, but it, it functions that way, right? It's a very hierarchical command structure, and the decisions are made by centralized um, uh, nerve centers in Idaho for the federal response, um, in Sacramento and or other areas for California statewide response. And increasingly, it involves people from other countries coming in. So we send firefighters to Australia when they're having their brush fires. They send firefighters here, Canada, etc. It's absolutely key in dealing with fire um, to have um, science and, and, and rigorous science brought to bear on what's going on. And there's really cool new science coming on each uh, all the time now because fires are such a threat, there's finally funding available to deal with stuff. Um, I won't, yeah, I'll hold my tongue on some of this until we get to the next lecture. But suffice it to say, um, uh, science can really help inform us in terms of what fuels are existing. So mapping, GIS, all the stuff you guys learn in ESRM, um, all those skills desperately needed by local, county, statewide, federal um, fire agencies. And, um, and that we know what the, how they help us tell what the fuels are, how the fire might behave uh, due to atmospheric conditions, et cetera, and what the fire history is. So, you know, what was the last time we had the fire in this area and how did it behave under those conditions? And then, of course, education. Education in particular for um, the populations, our, our, our friends, our brothers and sisters, our neighbors that are living in the wild, the so-called WUI, the Wildlands Urban Interface, the people that are right up where the vegetation is and not in the urban core. Those folks in particular, um, there's lots of stuff they can do to minimize fire um, risk, uh, both from their starting fires, but also uh, protecting their property, et cetera. Because when we do have these fires, the number one priority always is protect people's lives. Once we have people's lives protected, then to the extent possible, protect properties. And then other things, then the endangered bird and all this and that. Um, so, so where we have people's um, uh, uh, built environment vulnerable, that's going to, by definition, act as, a, as an organizing principle for the fire responders. And so educating people to that is, um, is really key. Uh, the classic one I think about is um, where some of my friends used to live in Cambria, Central California, fantastic uh, pine forests, beautiful pine, coastal pine forests. What happened? 
starting in the 60s, 70s, people said, this is, this is a cool forest. I want to move into the forest. So they literally moved into the forest, put, put houses in this pine forest because it, it looks cool, right? I mean, I think it looks cool. I got trees all around us, but now there's trees all around you. So the very fact that these people moved into the, the burnable landscape made it much more likely that that landscape would burn, one. Two, it means that now when there's a fire, all these firefighters have to come in and defend these houses intermixed amongst all this vegetation. It only takes a, a big fire or two for people to get super scared, and then a new policy comes on that says you have to clear around your property. So now these folks that moved into, the, moved into this location because they love the trees are finding themselves clearing trees all around their property because it's a threat. So, so educating people that, you know, this is a consequence if you if you choose to go down this path and that's what we're going to – that's the cycle that we're going to get sucked into. Do we really want to be engaged in that cycle? Or maybe would it be better to have a park here which you can go walk your bike on, walk your dog, you know, uh, go meditate in, all that great stuff. But maybe not your house being in the middle of that forest um, and that might be better. So education is a key aspect of that. Other things, uh, data collection, both – uh, formal official uh, data collection by the agencies and also by uh, informal research efforts like stuff that we do at Channel Islands, other other researchers or other NGOs do, um, uh, and creating maps of potential risk and evacuation routes and all that kind of stuff. And then um, perhaps the most or one of the most important things is prescribed burns. Um, we must get better with prescribed burns, controlled burns. Um, it, this, this bullet, I, I need to fix this. This bullet says to manage forests, that's BS. It's to manage all of our landscape, not just forests. Um, so when I first went up to Stanford and started my postdoc, one of the things I wanted to do was use fire to help manage my grasslands. I went to 19 different control burns before I saw my friend was able to partake in my first control burn. So, uh, 18 times I went, well, sometimes it wasn't, it wasn't actually at the site. Sometimes it was that day. So it was supposed to start at like 9 a.m. and at like 7 a.m. they called it off. But, but nevertheless, um, you know, within hours of when it was supposed to start, these control burns are almost always killed, almost always killed. Um, so, uh, yeah, should I talk about that now or let's see, where, where are we time? Okay, I guess I'll talk about it now real quick. So um, so the idea here is um, native peoples have burned these landscapes. These landscapes have burned on their own before people were even here. What we've done in, um, in our modern policy uh, with the creation of the U.S. Forest Service is we created Smokey Bear and we created a policy of fire suppression a policy of stopping fire at all costs. That's problematic. And so that allowed fuels to build up. And so when we did have fire, initially, you know, stop fires. But now when we have fires, we have such massive fuel burnt, built up to say nothing of climate change and all the other factors. But just in, in and of our actions by themselves, we're, we make it more likely that devastating fires are going to happen. So the way we get out of this is, or one of the ways we can uh, minimize the problem is to actually burn the landscape more. Now, we don't want to burn the landscape like the Thomas Fire, or the Woolsey Fire, or the Paradise Fire, or anything like that. We want to burn it in a way that doesn't cause as much of the downside, right? And so we want to burn it, but burn it uh, smaller chunks more frequently, right? So not, not one big horrendous conflagration every 20 years, but a little bit every single year, right? And so the analogy that I like to use is fire farming. We need to do more farming with fire. So it needs to be part of, just like we farm every month out of the year, farming to grow, grow vegetables and fruits and all that kind of stuff, we need to do the same thing, right? We need to be comfortable with it. The problem is because we haven't, because we've lost that um, memory, that memory that um, is being resurrected by some of our um, uh, tribal communities, some of our um, uh, colleagues in and around the state of California, Pacific Northwest, uh, elsewhere, um, some of the aborig Aboriginal communities in Australia, et cetera. Um, that's great. That's awesome. Um, but 
the government bureaucracy is such that it hasn't qu quite caught up yet. And these so far tend to be more um, piecemeal activities and sort of more one-off things. We need this to become the, the, the norm. So the reason that those 18 control burns that I went to were called off, because so first and foremost, we want to burn when they're most efficacious. Many cases, we're trying to take care of some of the fuel, things like these non-native invasive grasses. When's the best time to burn those? Uh, late spring, right? So we want, we want these plants to burn all their energy, send up all their stems, just starting to flower is when we want to burn them, right? So just, they haven't said seeds yet, just starting to, to you know, okay, they, they've, they've put all this energy and they've burned through all their reserves and they don't have much energy in their roots and this and that and their tubers and stuff, and now they're all tall and big, burn them, right? Boom, burn them, boom. And then you take them out uh, before they can set seed. And so there will be some that survive, but those ones that survive will have burnt a lot of their energy, right? And they won't, if they do survive, they're not going to be as big. They're not going to make as many seeds, right? So we want to use it, you know, target it as to when it's most efficacious ecologically. The risk managers, though, say, no, 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 no. It's harder to control fires in and it's true in spring and summer, right? Early summer. And so they say it's much better to do it in late fall, right? Let's do it in late fall where if we do screw up, if we do have the fire get loose and, and run rampant, uh, it, it'll can only run rampant for a few weeks and then the winter rains will come and put it out, right? Um, so that makes, I guess, sense if you know nothing about the ecology, if you know nothing about nat natural history, if you know nothing about these natural systems, and all that you think of is lawsuits, I guess that makes sense. But from the perspective of, of dealing with the fuel loads, dealing with the risk, dealing with the invasive species that are making, it, making there be more fuel and more flashy fuel, we want to burn at other times. Um, so, so, so one, we, we have that problem of people worried about the fire getting out of control and some control birds absolutely have gotten out of control and have absolutely caused problems and people sue, right? And they say, Hey, I'm, you're paying for my house. You're paying for my this and that. Right. Um, and unfortunately sometimes people have actually died also in, because of the fire started by control burns. So that, we don't want that to happen. The other major problem with, or other major barrier to us using control burns aside from the, the fiscal liability um, is the issue of air quality. And so we'll get this a lot. So because we have air quality problems in California, the Bay Area, LA, the Central Valley, places like this, um, we want to start to do a control burn and it'll be in whatever, summertime, right? And we're getting ready and all the plants, and I should say to do a control burn takes years of preparation, right? You have to have, have the justification. You have to have the fire crews ready and available. And with our crazy wildfire seasons, a lot of times we don't have the crews available because they're busy fighting actual wildfires, fires. But, but we get all that ready. We get it all set up. We usually call it some type of training exercise for the firefighters. So we're going to do a practice fire so that the, the new guys can, can learn or the old guys can, can hone their skills or try some new techniques. And so, uh, so anyway, so we're doing that. And then we're getting ready to go. And the air quality control board, the regional air quality control board in that area says, oh, no, man. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We got an inversion layer. There's a lot of cars driving a work today and there's a lot of soot in the air and pollution in the air. So we're not, we're not going to do that. No, no, you can't, you can't because it's going to screw the air quality up. So you cannot. And so they'll kill it the last minute. Most of my, most of the, those, those first 18 I tried to go to were killed because of air quality uh, concerns. The irony is the air quality is so much worse now because of these large scale fires. So this, this last, um, See, fire season, uh, my friends in, in Oregon, uh, we don't know how bad the air got. So on the sensors, this, the amount of soot and gunk in the air was such that we, it went off a scale. Never happened before. We didn't think you could get, uh, you know, occasionally a sensor might fall in the mud or something. Like that, but we haven't, we've never had it where we have a, a, a region of, of sensors that absolutely get pinged. So we don't know how bad the air quality got, but it was, it was horrible. And so another consequence of, and you know, we don't want people with asthma to, to 
have problems breathing or anything like that, right? We want to warn them and say, hey, you guys, on on this date, you know, this afternoon, stay indoors. If you have if you have respiratory issues, we're going to be doing a controlled burn, right? But again, we want to do it small, short term, so that we can you know start reducing those fuel loads, etc. And we don't have a Thomas fire. We don't have a Sonoma, you know, Napa fires or or any of these fires that we have that go on for weeks and weeks and weeks and make those people that have respiratory issues really, really in bad shape. Um, so, so prescribed burns, a key tool, absolutely something we can improve on, absolutely something we, we need to do better on and something we need to be burning many, many times more than we are. So we have to get really aggressive with prescribed burns. Um, uh, we'll talk about perception um, later, but suffice it to say, people don't really get, and I would say it's not just wildfires. Many of these disasters we'll talk about in our class, people do not really fully get um, until they've been burned themselves. Um, but the short version to just end this real quick here, the, at least this component of our discussion of wildfires, um, is that uh, we here in California have pushed into more burnable landscapes, right? So, so um, one, in our effort to have massive ma McMansions and have sort of this luxury housing, two, to provide more affordable housing. Both, both forces historically have... Um, seen the answer as pushing into grasslands, shrublands, forests, et cetera, um, on hillsides, uh, various locations, because the grasslands, the flatlands have pretty much already been built in this at this point, um, where we have more fire risk. And um, uh, historically, that was underwritten by insurance companies. And, and what we'll see over the course of this class, not just with wildfires, but in where we have failings, of our of our individual responsibility, where we have failings of public policy to really enact strong laws or other other policy guidance to to influence stuff, where the politicians are failing that, our elected leaders are failing that, we see the insurance industry stepping in and providing the fiscal signal, the economic signal to deal with flooding, wildfire risk, earthquake risk, whatever the, the case may be. And we're seeing the same thing here with wildfire and the case of, of Ventura and places like that. People, um, yes, they got some money from the insurance company. That's a whole story. Not very few people got enough money to rebuild their homes because they didn't have the, that in their policy. But, but so they maybe got their money from this past fire, or at least some amount of money. But when they've tried to rebuild, they've found that they cannot get or it's extremely difficult to get insurance. And so, so again, that signal is coming from private industry in the form of underwriting um, rather than from a, a state policy or a county policy or a federal policy. Um, yeah, and, and we'll talk about more of these later, but suffice to say, we have a series of warnings, just like we have warnings for hurricanes, etc. Education is a big thing. I, I give a talk or so every every year or two to different groups in Ojai or places around about um, fire safe education. So, so uh, fire safe building, fire safe um, landscaping, um, all these things are, are important. And, and Ventura County is actually one of the leaders in the state um, in terms of fostering more uh, specific codes and regulations to deal with wildfire risk in particular. And in fact, the the brush clearance that's now statewide came from Ventura County and then Ventura County and San Diego County. And then from there, it, pr it propagated to the entire state. Again, we just mentioned, touched on fire insurance. And then another component here, which we can talk about more when we get to our case study, but suffice it to say is evacuation. How are we going to deal with wildfire? Again, from an urban core, when we have a fire, you can go in pretty much any direction in the built environment. <clears throat> And many of these most problematic uh, places, like in the Santa Monica Mountains and some of these communities that are in Bell Canyon and, and places like this that are, uh, you know, up, up a canyon road, one road in, one road out, um, huge problem. The, the term there that you may or may not have heard of is so-called shelter in place. So historically, when we have a fire, the answer is, hey, get out of there. Again, because we want the people out, right? The firefighters will first want to protect the people's lives. 
then if people are all safe, then they'll work on the um, on the property. And so, uh, so historically, the policy has been get people out super fast, right? S give these alerts, give these warnings, you know, get out, get out, right? In many of these places, it's it may not be possible to get out. We saw this in Paradise, unfortunately, tragically, when so many people died. Um, and and the general approach in some of these areas is to say, well, if it's not possible to get out, mm, then don't get out. Then you will so-called shelter in place. You'll stay in your house or in your your pool area or wherever it is in supposedly a, a fire safe place um, and just wait for the fire to go around you in essence. Um, uh, not ideal, <laughs> I would say, not ideal. Um, but, uh, but, but evacuations are a very important aspect of disasters and how we respond to them and how we, how we talk about what is allowed in our communities.